God's undeserved love is yours today through the message of the cross of our Savior, and it comes in our fifth Lenten series for this year. Our text is taken from Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But far be it for me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Here ends our text. Greetings to you in the name of the one who is our boast and our glory, the <coughs> fellow redeemed. What's your proudest accomplishment? Is it the achievement of your desired career? Is it your children? Is it reaching financial security? What's the top goal that you have for your life? Perhaps your proudest accomplishment is yet to come. Perhaps your best days are ahead of you. But we all have different goals and accomplishments regardless of who we are. But God has one piece of advice for us, and that advice comes to us in the simple verse of our text for this morning. Be careful what you wish for. God speaks this both to believers and unbelievers alike, a message that reaches the entire world. We ask for the Holy Spirit's blessing upon us today as we look at what our boast and our accomplishments should be. Today we're used to people setting the goal to achieve financial security. It seems that if nothing else, people want to be able to leave something to their relatives or to their children if they can't do anything else. It wasn't always this way though. Back in ancient times, before the digital age of the internet and the age of mass communication, people simply wanted to be remembered. They wanted to do something in their life that would bring glory and honor upon their name and upon their family's name. For many people, that was the key to a successful life. To be remembered meant that their priorities and their accomplishments were fulfilled. To be remembered meant that some part of them could continue on after they die. Now it's not wrong for us to have earthly goals or to try to accomplish things in our lives or even to take pride in what we've done. But may those things never replace what God has done for us. May our earthly goals and the accomplishments we want in our life never trump what God has done for us and the glory that we should show Him. Paul knew how dangerous it was to seek after personal glory. He tells us about it in the single verse of our text. In this one verse, we're given a little bit of an insight into the personal faith of Paul. Here he took pride, he took glory in one thing only, and that was in the cross of his Savior. Some people might think it was strange that Paul would say that he only found his glory in the cross of Jesus. After all, when you look at the life of Paul, he was quite an accomplished individual. Paul was well educated. He grew up in the school of the Pharisees where he learned just about everything that was needed to be successful. Paul was born both as a Jew and as a Roman citizen, so that gave him greater access to things in his life. Paul traveled almost the entire known world at that time, at a time when most people never left the village they were born in. Truly, if there was somebody who could take pride and boast in his accomplishments, it would have been Paul. He had great opportunity to accomplish things in his life and to find personal glory for his name. And yet despite that point, Paul tells us, he only found glory, he only boasted in one thing, and that was what his Savior had done for him. The only thing Paul found glory in was that Jesus had paid for his sins. Could we say the same about our lives as Paul has told us about his? Is Christ's cross the only glory and the only boast that we have in our lives? Well, none of us can honestly admit that it is. We all have numerous times where we put our own personal goals, our own accomplishments in life, ahead of what Jesus has done for us. 
How many times have we kicked God to the back seat so that we can get honor for our need? So that we can do what we want to in life instead of what he tells us we should do. None of us can honestly admit that we have put Christ's cross first. None of us can say that we have glory only in the cross, as the Apostle Paul tells us this morning. But even though that goal of boasting in Christ's cross alone may seem like it's unattainable to us because of our sinful flesh, it's still a worthy goal to have, and Paul tells us why as well. So often people spend their entire lives working for some personal goal, and working for some way to feel satisfied as if they've done something important in their life, as if they've accomplished something so that they can feel like it's been worth it. But most often when people accomplish their goals, even if they're goals that they've worked their entire life to accomplish, they're disappointed. That's because our earthly and temporal goals can't give us the inner peace that we desire. By nature, we're all lacking peace inside of our hearts. We're all torn because of sin in our lives. We're all looking for some type of way that we can be productive. But it's not going to happen by accomplishing what you and I want to do. It's only going to happen by finding the inner peace of faith, that inner peace that comes through the cross of Christ. We're used to the familiar saying in life that money can't buy happiness. Perhaps that saying resonates in your life. Perhaps you've experienced something personal in your life where you can tell that money has not given you happiness. We can say the same about our personal glory, can't we? No matter what kind of lofty goals we have, no matter how hard we work in our lives to accomplish them, they're never going to give us what we want. They're never going to give us what we expect. Paul tells us, what Christ did on the cross, the difference that the cross makes for us. The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The difference between the cross of Jesus and all of our other earthly goals is the effect that it has on us. When Christ was nailed to the cross, he took all of the world's glory, all of the world's boasting, all of our temporal goals with it. The only thing that remains needful now is faith in Jesus as our Savior. He's the only one who has paid the full payment for our sins. The reason we need to be careful about what we wish for is because we often wish for worthless things. We carry around a sinful flesh that wants to grab hold of what the world tells us we should wish for. Our sinful nature wants us to go out into the world and say, well, well maybe Christ isn't the only way to salvation. Maybe I can do something good on my own. Maybe I do have a little bit of goodness in me, if, if only just a little. The sinful flesh that we carry around with us wants us to lay hold of anything but the cross of Christ. And because of that, so often what we wish for is not what we need. So often what we expect and what we spend our time looking for is nothing that's going to help. The only glory for the Christian is what Jesus Christ has done for him or her. Yes, we are thankful for the blessings. We are thankful for the opportunities and for the goals and accomplishments that God provides in our lives. But those things do not hold a candle to what Jesus has done for us. Christ's death on the cross has crucified your sinful flesh. It has brought an end to its power over you. The only way that your sinful flesh can get what it wants now is if you give into it. It has no power over you. Christ has given you a victory over it. And yet if you reject that, you'll still succumb to its temptations. It's true that we're all faced with temptations after temptation. And we're all faced with numerous tribulations in life. And at times it seems like we have nowhere to turn. But our hope is continually in Christ. And the amazing thing about Christ is he is able to turn even those wicked things, even temptations and evil things, into blessings for our lives. By nature, we want to feel some sort of entitlement. 
We want to feel that the goals and accomplishments and the glory that we receive in our lives can somehow translate into glory from God. But in this single verse of our text, Paul gets rid of that thinking right away. Because the very thing that Christ did on the cross was to crucify the world's glory. We can't win salvation through success and honor on our own name. We can't be looking for boasting and glory about what we have done because it's a broken system. It doesn't work anymore. Christ has destroyed it. What we expect by our flesh, what we want by our sinful nature, is going to disappoint us. If we expect to find inner peace like we get with faith for what we do, we're never going to be content. We're always going to be looking for something more. Now you may think to yourself, well, I already know this. That's why I'm a Lutheran. That's why I come to this church. That's why I'm a member of the CLC. But take heed of this own temptation in your life. The very moment that you think you're above the temptation is the very moment that Satan will strike. He wants you to feel secure. He wants you to feel as if there's no danger, and then he goes in for the kill. We need to be aware of the temptation of glory in our boasting for our own lives. Just because we're Lutherans, just because we're Christians, doesn't mean we're above it. It means that we're more susceptible to it. We see different attitudes in our lives that reflect glory in ourselves, don't we? <clears throat> Do we ever look down upon those that are outside of our fellowship, as if there's something inside of us that has led us to this church and given us the truth, and there's some sort of quality that makes us better than them? Do you ever get angry or indifferent because something is not the way that you're used to having it done, even if it's not wrong? Understand the temptation of glorying in our own selves. Understand the temptation to boast about what we want rather than about what God has told us. As Christians, this is the very temptation that Satan is going to throw at you the most. He's not going to attack you with what you think is he's going to do. He's going to come at you in a cunningly and deceptive way. He's going to tell you, you're a Christian. You don't have to worry about doing anything wrong. You don't have to worry about self-examining your life. You're okay. But the Apostle Paul tells us, don't boast in yourself. Don't find glory in your accomplishments, even your accomplishments as a Christian. Look only to the cross of Christ. As members of the CLC, as Lutherans, as Christians, we need to be aware of the danger of trying to speak the truth in a deceptive way. Don't confuse speaking the truth of God's word with an opportunity to boast for your own personal glory. We should not use God's word as a footstool to our own goals and our own accomplishments of bringing honor upon our name. Rather, God wants us to use his word as servants, as lovingly giving it out to other people freely as it has been given to us. But the second half of Paul's statement goes hand in hand with the first. Just as we have been crucified to the world, so in turn the world has been crucified to us. What Paul means by the second statement is that the unbelieving world will continue to rage and fight against Christianity. We know that to be true in our lives. It doesn't take much to look out into the media or into the internet or to other people who disagree with us, and they fight and they rage against what we believe. Paul didn't have to go far either to see this type of attitude in his own life. He lived under a government that tried to kill him. As Christians, they were in very danger of their lives because of what they believed. If the unbelieving world had its wish, Christ and his church would vanish, would be wiped out from the face of the world. They desired to make the cross of Christ of no effect. But what Paul tells us in our text is, just as it makes no sense to boast in ourselves and in our own accomplishments for our salvation, so likewise, it doesn't make any sense to fight against Christ's church. He has won the victory on the cross. He has defeated every evil that lay before us. 
Why fight against him? Christ's cross is the buffer that separates us between our enemies from those who would seek to rob us of our faith. Yes, we will be persecuted in our lives. Sometimes our lives may even be taken away. But nothing can rob us from that peace of faith. Nothing can rob us from the eternity that God has promised us in heaven. That's the ultimate blessing that the cross of Christ has given you. That's what he wants you to boast about. That's what he wants you to find glory in. By the cross of Christ, the world has been crucified to us. This means that we no longer abide by the broken system of the law. It's no longer up to us to keep God's word perfectly to achieve our own salvation. It's no longer up to us to glory in what we have done in order to find a perfect status before God. That system is gone. It's done away with. In the very same way, we have been crucified to the world. We are set apart by God. He has sanctified us by His Word for a special purpose, and the unbelieving world does not like that. Don't be surprised when you're tempted and tested and persecuted for your faith. That means you're a Christian. That means you have Christ in you when those things happen. Don't be surprised. Don't be discouraged. Don't let that rob you of the peace that you have. God tells us those things are necessary because we live in a sinful world. We live at a time when people hate Christ and His message. If they were willing to condemn Him to death and to crucify Him even though He was innocent, what do you think they're going to do to His followers? But in the very same token, how are we to respond to those who persecute us? How are we to respond to the tribulations and the tests that we face because of our faith? Well, look to the very verse of our text for today. Let God be your glory. Humble yourself before Him. Allow those tests and persecutions to come upon you and understand that He is going to bring you through them. Because of His love for you, He is able to use those things to strengthen your faith in Him and to bring you closer to Him, not to drive you away. But also understand that we need to respond to those who hate us and those who mock us, and those who persecute us with that very same love. We need to bring God's grace into their lives, not feelings of enmity and bitterness because of what they've done to us. Cast aside your own glory and put Christ's glory in place. When you do that, you will respond with love. You will respond with the gospel message of forgiveness even to those who have done wrong to you. Jesus told his own followers in his ministry not to be surprised when this kind of thing happens. <clears throat> During one of his very first sermons, he said these words, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. As John the Baptist put it, Christ must increase and I must increase decrease. The proper way to respond to the tests and tribulations of this world is to give Christ the glory that he deserves. By that way, he will not only strengthen you and refine your faith, but he will help those who have persecuted you. This is the way of Christ. This is the way of his church. And this is what he wants us to be doing in our own lives. We know what happened to the Roman nation that persecuted Paul. It's the same thing that happened to all of Christ's enemies. It simply faded away into nothing. No matter what persecutes you today, no matter who mocks you or ridicules you for your faith, understand that those ideas and those philosophies will simply fade into nothing because of Christ's cross. He is the victor. He is the one who has paid for sin. He is the perfect substitute the Lamb of God. Through His very death on the cross, He has not only restored our relationship and all those who believe in Him, but He has also conquered all of our enemies. To us who walk by faith, it doesn't seem strange that Paul would boast only in the cross of Christ. That indeed is our prayer as well. Christ's praise and honor and glory 
is the only lasting thing in the world. The only thing worth taking pride in. Paul boasted on this about this glory on a number of occasions in his life. In 2 Corinthians 12, he found boasting and glory in Christ in spite of his sinful limitations and weaknesses of the flesh. Even though he had physical ailments of his body, like, much like many of us do, he found glory in Christ's power because through his limitations, Christ would show that power to others. In Romans chapter 5, our sermon text from last weekend, Paul encouraged the Christians around him to rejoice no matter what happened to them. Because by those things, Christ was showing his power to them. Christ was strengthening their faith and giving them hope. This is the same thing that Paul desires for us to learn about as well. Don't be indifferent to those outside our church. Don't hate something just because it's not the way we have done it. Look to Christ alone. Be led and guided by His Word alone. For that is our only source of comfort and hope. And only through that Word and following that Word will we be able to properly boast in our Savior. <coughs> be careful what you wish for. This reminder stands firm for all people, believers and unbelievers alike. If your wish is for personal glory and for boasting in what you've done,